Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. My name is Dominic Taroli and I am responsible for 3D markets at Esri. With me today is Brendan Jarrett. He's a technical director at Walt Disney Animation Studio. Brendan, glad to have you on the webinar and welcome. Howdy. I'm glad to be here. Good. But before we start, I want to congratulate Brandon and the whole team at Walt Disney Animation Studios for winning the Oscar for animated feature film this year for Zootopia. And I guess with over a billion in worldwide ticket sales, that is well deserved. Then I would also like to say thank you to the people who made this webinar possible. That is Nancy and Eric from the Visual Effects Society, as well as Amy, Nick, Pratt, and the whole team at Walt Disney Animation Studios. Thank you very much for all your support. That is much appreciated. Now, what is on today's agenda? First, we want to bring everybody on the same page with cities in our Cities 101. Then, Brandon will give you an overview about the creation process and the pipeline integration of the city Zootopia. And at the end, we should have some time for feedback and Q&A. Hope that works for you. And before we start, we just have three housekeeping items to cover. First, if you have a question, please feel free to use the question window, type in your question and then click send. Second, for your convenience, we set up a box folder with all the content and links from today's webinar. You can access this box folder at bit.ly slash VS webinar underscore 1707. This URL is case sensitive, so please write it quickly down or make a picture screenshot right now. Okay, and we will repeat that URL one more time at the end of the webinar. And last but not least, we will have a booth at SIGGRAPH next week in beautiful Los Angeles. So if you want to meet City Engine Mastermind Pascal Mueller and myself for a personal City Engine meeting, please use the link bit.ly slash sick CE 2017. And please note that again, this URL is case sensitive, but it's also in our box folder. But now let's get started. With our Cities 101 and why cities are becoming more and more essential characters of movie blockbusters like Zootopia. So 2007 was quite a remarkable year, not only because of the iPhone, the start of the mortgage crisis, or Rihanna's ultra successful pop song Under My Umbrella, but also because 2007 was the turning point when for the first time in human history, more than 50% of the world population were living in cities. And we suspect that this trend also influenced filmmakers around the globe to show more cities in their movies. And cities became essential characters of movie blockbusters like Cars 2, Total Recall, Big Hero 6, Man of Steel, Independence Day Resurgeon, and for sure also for Zootopia. But how hard is it actually to create those cities? Let's answer this question and let's start with the buildings. Take, for example, Redlands, a small town one hour eastwards from Los Angeles. The population is around 70,000 people, but it already has 26,000 buildings. Another example is Orlando with the population around a quarter million. And we already count over 100,000 buildings or the third biggest city in the US, Chicago, that comprise over a million buildings with a population around 3 million people. And in total for the US, we talk about well over 100 million buildings. Now let's quickly calculate how long it would take us to manually model all these buildings. And let's assume that you can model one building in 15 minutes. Even then, you would invest 6,500 hours to model a small town like Redlands. For Orlando, it would be 14 man years of work. And if you dare to model a city like Chicago, it's a whooping 300,000 hours or 150 man years. But once you have the buildings, <laughs> the fun just really starts, right? 
A city does not only contain buildings. A city also includes facades, lights, windows, streets, street furniture, roofs, rooftop, and so on. And this can easily become a very time-consuming and tedious production task. So therefore, the solution here really is to use smart technology instead of tedious manual labor work. So what you see here in this diagram is on the y-axis, total cost or hours, and on the x-axis, the amount of quality content or design. So instead of having a more buildings, more time correlation, we can break it with procedural technology, where we first define rules in a library so that we can create those beautiful cities with thousands and thousands of buildings, with adding all that time, like Brandon did for Zootopia. And with that, I hand it over to Brandon. And Brandon, I make you now a presenter. And Brandon, the floor is yours. Okay. There we go. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, howdy to all you webinar attendees, and thank you for tuning in. I'm really excited about all the stuff I have to share with you all today. Uh, but first, just a quick reminder, I have to ask you, please don't record anything in this presentation. Uh, it's intended for the VES streaming audience only. <clears throat> So first, a little about me. Uh, I'm my, my name is Brandon Jarrett. I'm a general technical director at Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, I graduated from Texas A&M uh, with computer science and visualization degrees, and first interned at Disney in 2012, uh, and was fortunate enough to be hired on full time in January of 2013. I started working on Big Hero 6 as my first film, and I've been lucky to work on a bunch of great projects since then, including Zootopia, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, right now, I'm in the middle of working on Ralph Breaks the Internet, Wreck-It Ralph 2. So at Walt Disney Animation Studios, we strive to create compelling stories set in believable worlds and populated with appealing characters. Today, I'm going to focus on that middle part, creating believable worlds, not necessarily realistic worlds. After all, a city full of talking animals and wearing clothes and using mobile phones is not exactly realistic but believable in that you believe the characters would actually inhabit that world. And as geography and scale and style complement and support the story that we're trying to tell. At Disney, we've been creating believable worlds for our films for nearly 80 years. In 1937, the Walt Disney Studios released its first fully animated feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and pioneered a new form of family entertainment. More than seven decades later, oh, excuse me, eight decades later, Walt Disney Animation Studios continues to honor its heritage through animated films that combine beautiful artistry, masterful storytelling, and groundbreaking technology. We try to carry on that legacy of artistic and technical advancement with each of our films, and Zootopia was no exception. Director Byron Howard developed his idea for the world of Zootopia, and soon Rich joined as co-director with Clark Producing. Byron and Rich spent a lot of time thinking about the world, what kind of animals would live in it, and what it would be like. The initial pitch for the film started with a simple concept. We've seen movies with animals being animals in the natural world. We've seen movies with animals being animals in the human world. And we've even seen movies with animals being like humans in a human-like world. But what we haven't seen is animals acting like animals in a modern world made by and for animals, a world where humans never existed. Now, telling that story, creating a living, breathing city for this film to take place, requires a great diversity of animal characters. There are nearly 70 species of animals in the film, all with varying scale, from the tallest giraffe to the tiniest shrew. And in order to accommodate all these differently sized animals, we had to design and build a world that fit with all of these animal types. In most instances, that turned out to use something we call multi-scaling, which you can see demonstrated in this early piece of concept art. So as the look and feel of Zootopia started to take shape, we had to ask the question, how can we build this out on a city-sized scale? Are there ways we can be smart about this and use technology to achieve what we need on a tight production schedule, rather than hand modeling and hand placing an entire city full of buildings? 
These are questions that many city planners have to try to answer in real life, but we had to think about the answers for this fictional animal city that no one had ever seen before. So we're building a totally fictional animal city from the ground up. Where do you start? Well, at Disney, everything starts with research. Production designer Dave Getz and associate, associate production designer Dan Cooper, along with art directors Corey Loftus and Matthias Lechner, were charged with designing what this world would look like. They started with natural landscapes as inspiration. For example, these giant rocks in China that look like skyscrapers. And so they came up with skyscrapers that look like giant rocks. All of the architecture is informed by something in the natural world. And paintings like this one are crucial because they define the look and feel of the world and inspire all of the visuals that end up on screen. So that concept of multi-scaling I mentioned before also meant thinking about objects and vehicles that could accommodate animals of all sizes. For example, there are bigger and smaller trains and each one has many door sizes to fit the different animals. And this train ends up being kind of important because as it turns out, a train ride through the city would be the most effective way to introduce the audience and our main character, Judy Hobbs, to the city of Zootopia and each of its districts. In addition to building a city that would be comfortable for different sizes of animals, one of the main ideas was to design each quarter of the city as its own ecosystem. How else could you get polar bears, jaguars, rabbits, and camels to live in one city together? Creating distinct climates not only keeps all the animal residents happy, but also gives us the chance to design each district with nature in mind. In order to fulfill the needs of the story and actually take us on a train ride around the city, we had to fully build out each district. We needed an entire city layout, complete with streets, residential and business zones, and distinct construction, all while thinking about the principles of geodesign. We needed it all built with a very small team, and we needed it fast. So how can a small team build a large urban environment very quickly? Well, fortunately, we had some previous experience with City Engine during the production of Big Hero 6. It was an invaluable tool for us to achieve the kind of scale and visual complexity required for the city of San Francisco in the film. San Francisco is based on the actual geography of San Francisco. So on Big Hero 6, we started with real San Francisco city data and plugged in our own building groupings and Japanese-inspired architecture on top of it. In this image on the right, you can see some of our lots in City Engine that were all imported from real San Francisco city, San Francisco city data. So this is a quick breakdown of how we use City Engine for just one shot in the film. There are over 83,000 buildings, 260,000 trees, and over 215,000 street lights, all exported from City Engine. And that was for just one shot out of many in the film that use City Engine to build and export city assets. But we can't just turn around and use the exact same thinking for Zootopia due to some fundamental differences between this film and Big Hero 6. For example, Big Hero 6 was based on actual real world geography and city data. Zootopia is completely fictional, so we have no pre existing data to go on. We're basically starting from scratch with concept art and with some hand sculpted terrain maps. Big Hero 6 was also built at a consistent mentioned before has to accommodate wildly different animal scales. We might place mouse buildings in between regular size buildings, and so our distribution is affected by that. So when you have no real world data to start with, what's the first step? Well, like any good city planner, we start by making a map. This is one of the earliest maps for the city of Zootopia. You can see the beginnings of each district and how it fits together into the whole. And looking at this map led to several questions. How do we divide up the world based on this concept art? How do we connect our neighboring districts together in an organic way? And perhaps most importantly, how do we distribute our buildings across each of these districts? And all of those questions were before the practical data concerns. Once we create and export this stuff, can we even open any of it in Maya? How can we structure our city engine workspace and scene files to allow organized rapid iteration based on designer feedback? And how can we share the workload and have more than one person making changes to our city at the same time? So city engine operates around the notion of a workspace or a project. And this is nice because it keeps all of your data in one place that city engine knows about, but it can be difficult to have more than one user working in the same project simultaneously. On Big Hero 6, we had already tried using a Git repository to treat our 
city engine rules and our custom Python scripts like a code base uh, where we could commit and push changes uh, from multiple users. And we had a fair amount of success with that. But this time around, we thought, why not put the entire city engine workspace inside of Git? So this way, any user who wants to make changes to some part of the city wouldn't need to go to a special production area or do any kind of crazy setup. He or she would just be able to check out the city tools Git repo and get the latest state of the city. So we store rule files, Python scripts, maps, and even city engine scene files are all within the same repo. We also sim linked the model directory of the city engine workspace to a special production area in our pipeline where we stored all of the building parts that we used to visualize the city inside a city engine. And that way the repository wasn't carrying around gigabytes and gigabytes of extra geometry data that we didn't need. So once we landed on a data management strategy for the workspace, and after looking at that initial map artwork that I showed in the last slide, we came up with the idea of a unified multi-layer map of all the districts. This map has a bunch of layers, uh, grayscale height values, exclusion and obstacle maps, distribution regions, and some color information to help visualize things inside a city. Each of, these, each of these layers can be turned on or off to view the data we need for a given task. And on Big Hero 6, we were working directly from pre-existing satellite and geo survey data. So we were able to get to work pretty quickly uh, with confidence that uh, our ground truth was solid. Uh, for Zootopia, all of these maps had to be generated by an artist. And the exact shape of the terrain went through numerous iterations, so we had to be able to handle these changes in our city engine scene and adapt to new terrain. So all these layers are laid on top of each other to maintain alignment and scale. All you have to do uh, to add a new map layer in city engine uh, is import one of these images generated from this map and set it at the right size, uh, and it should line up with everything else. So this is the very first early city engine pass of the plaza and downtown core districts, laid on top of a very early rough ground plane using some imported previs buildings uh, in OBJ formats and scaled to their approximate size. Uh, at this point, we had very little to go on other than the approximate shape of the ground and a desire to make some leaf-like street patterns. Uh, you might recognize some of those building shapes in the center on top of the hill. Uh, that's the very recognizable silhouette uh, that proved to be a useful anchor around which to build the rest of the city. The red shape down the hill in the flatter area is the train station and main plaza of Zootopia. And here we use City Engine's streets generation tool with some custom parameters to quickly throw down some natural looking shapes we thought the art directors wanted to see. Matthias and Dave described the plaza streets as being something like Paris mixed with watering holes of wildebeest. Now here's our City Engine scene with the rest of the maps imported and aligned together. Each district map is a separate layer we can turn on or off. So they all stay connected, but we can focus on one piece at a time. So once the streets were drawn, we started with a very simple lot rule to create cube shapes as an approximation for buildings. Since these shapes were so simple and the geometry not particularly heavy, for this first pass, we just used City Engine's built-in FBX export to send this into Maya. This is the first pre version of the world layout inside of Maya. We're able to very quickly show what the density and visual pattern of the city might look like. You can also see some of the landmarks coming into being here, like the Palm Hotel in Sahara Square and the climate wall that separates it from Tundra Town. And this is all well and good, but we need to actually put some real buildings down at some point. So we'll dive into how we went about this going from previous to the final product. In the first part of the city we encounter on our train ride is Sahara Square. In the center of the district is the Ritzy Palm Hotel, which is shaped like a giant palm tree. Everything in Sahara Square is centered around the hotel and its oasis. The art directors wanted a more jagged, rocky shape for the parcels and streets here, getting sparser as we move away from the center. And here's what we came up with in City Engine. You can see the circular gap in the middle where the Palm Hotel and Oasis goes. This is, the city, again, using the City Engine streets generation tool with some custom parameters, uh, we can throw down those natural looking shapes the art directors wanted. In the Sahara, in particular, we're going for a blockier, rockier, more honeycomb shape uh, in keeping with the harsher desert climate and the densely packed buildings from the reference images that they gave to us. We also need to be able to quickly clear space, remove buildings, or modify our streets to adapt to terrain changes and accommodate creative feedback. And of course, we can't just fill a city with gray cubes, so we created a small library of buildings to suit each district, as well as some accessory parts to use for filling parcels and building walls. And the difficulty in using a relatively small number of distinct buildings is that if we see the same shape repeated across the district, it doesn't look like a real, organic, natural city. 
Uh, one way we combat this is with careful distribution rules to ensure we get a good mix of buildings on each parcel. And another way we can achieve greater variation is by constructing the buildings and the material palettes in a way that lets us mix and match to procedurally increase the number of possible variations. There were also modular wall pieces that City Engine could repeat and combine to dynamically create walls around parcels as shown in some of our reference images, like this one from Niger. So here's a good close-up example of one of our early tests for Sahara parcel construction, building distribution, and the results of our export and render process. The image on the left is in City Engine, and the red part is a map that represents our zoning areas. So we encode district information as attributes on the parcel shapes in City Engine. Then we calculate our scope and setbacks and our building choice based on the district that we're in. After placing our buildings, we use City Engine's reporting function in a custom Python script to write a proprietary data file that contains a record for each exported shape. We use another custom Python script that takes the gener generated reports and constructs a procedural data file, which we read back into Maya with Aurora, our in-house procedurals tool. Essentially, we create a particle system of buildings to represent each of these districts. And this procedural element can be imported into shops just the same as any other asset in the pipeline. So on the top right, you can see our example block represented interactively in one of our scene files. And then in the bottom right, we have the same block as a full color render. You can see the material variation on that uh, bottom building there. It's all the same shape, but because we have some flexibility in the way our materials are constructed, we can get a few different looks on it. This is a ground level test render of Sahara Square. And because each building in our library is hand modeled and designed to look good close to camera, we can go all the way down to this level and things hold up pretty well. You can see the color variation on the buildings as well as the small filler pieces and the walls that close in some of the parcel shapes. And if we zoom out, this is what we see. We get a full district that renders out like this. Sahara Square is made up of over 61,000 parts, which may include buildings, palm trees, walls, tents, and other things that we decide to sprinkle into the mix. So next up on the train ride was Tundra Town, and here the architecture is more Russian inspired. And you can see that in the final modeled assets as well. Uh, many of these buildings were reused from or very similar to the buildings created for the main plaza with some extra snow or spires added on top. This district went through quite a number of shape iterations to get the layout that we wanted. Uh, at first, Matthias wanted the streets to feel like ski trails coming down the mountain toward the frozen lake at the center of Tundra Town. So we tried a few shapes like this with the idea that the middle of those large blocks would be filled in or covered over with snow. And the terrain for the tundra kept changing, so we had to continually re-carve these blocks out of the new slopes. There was also the notion of using snow-covered trees going up the mountain once the building stopped. We got as far as this before we received a new direction for the lot shapes. Once the shots showing the tundra started to take better shape, the art directors decided to go with a street pattern more similar to those seen in the main plaza, but with a bit of a cracked ice feel. Uh, this was a drawover from Matthias showing what he wanted in the Tundra District. And this is what we came up with, with inside of City Engine. Uh, it, you'll recognize that ice bridge, uh, just an OBJ exported uh, from Maya and used inside of City Engine. I sort of positioned it uh, by hand, sort of eyeballing from that shot camera we were just looking through earlier. And this is a layout shot of the Tundra District. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the number of buildings and trees in this shot, but I know that the entire Tundra District contains over 30,000 city parts that were exported from City Engine, and that includes buildings and trees um, and other little pieces that we sprinkle in there. So moving on from the Tundra District, uh, the train moves through the tunnel, through the rainforest, and pulls around to the plaza and the downtown core. The art directors wanted a certain silhouette for the downtown core area in the middle of the city, uh, one that ascended higher in a sweeping arc up the hill. You can see the beginnings of that in this early test inside of City Engine, with a smaller plaza building starting at the bottom of the hill and larger buildings growing taller as you go up. And because of City Engine's procedural rules and the way we construct our building parts, we can hit those tall shapes very easily just by dragging a slider or even painting another map. And this makes incorporating creative feedback very simple and fast. We show a version, we get some feedback, we make some changes and show it again. The top image is my first attempt at getting that ascending silhouette that the art directors wanted. All the green stuff you see is buildings and trees exported from City Engine. 
The bottom image is a paint over or sketch from one of the art directors showing what he actually wanted to see. Having this kind of direction is extremely helpful, and because of the flexibility of our CD Engine workflow, I was able to make a fix and re-export that CD element the same afternoon. This is another view of the same downtown silhouette visualized in one of our scene files, using the City Engine elements mixed in with those distinct hand-modeled skyscrapers at the top of the hill. And if we zoom all the way out, we can see it all added together. This is a final frame from the film's train ride sequence. Each district in the city is made up of tens of thousands of parts. If we add them all together, there are over 300,000 city parts in this shot that were exported from City Engine. And I wish we could take you on that train ride around Zootopia on this stream, but unfortunately, video playback on the webinar is pretty choppy. So if you want to see the results in motion, I encourage you to go watch the film or check out the version of this presentation I gave at ESRI's user conference a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so if you do watch the train ride sequence, just pay attention to the mid to background city distance, uh, mid to background distance city stuff. Um, almost all of that was created with the help of City Engine. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank Brad Simonson, the associate producer on the film, for giving me a big Lego sandbox to play with on this movie. I'd like to thank our art directors, and a shout out to Brett Acorn, who helped spearhead much of the development of our City Engine workflow back in Make Hero 6. A uh, big thanks to everyone at ESRI for all of their help with the software. Uh, and helping us get started. Um, big thanks to fellow TD Alan Corcoran uh, and to the set extension team on Zootopia. I definitely wouldn't have been able to do all this work by myself. Uh, so thank you very much. And that's all I've got. Thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, that's super impressive. And uh, therefore, allow me to quickly summarize before we go uh, into the into the Q and A. Can you make me a presenter, please? Oh, yes. No, no, I can do it. That's good. There you go. Good. Thank you very much. So, summary. First of all, I just think that large cities like Zootopia, they are very beautiful and an essential part of many blockbuster movies these days. Second, cities are massive and can easily comprise several thousand of buildings. And finally, cities are extremely complex and include different elements such as building, vegetation, bridges, streets, and so on. Hence, the logical solution is to use smart technology that can break the correlation from more buildings equal more time or costs. And as Brandon just showed, procedural is one technology that can help you almost scale infinitely without compromising on design or quality. So if you want to test drive City Engine, it's the perfect time. We just released a brand new version of City Engine, City Engine 2017, and you can download the free 30-day City Engine trial at esri.com slash cityengine. And on esri.com slash visual effects, you will find predefined bundles for artists, projects, and studios. And again, for your convenience, uh, all those links are also in the box folder and all the other content and links from today's webinar. You can access this box folder one more time at bit.ly slash webinar underscore 1707. And if you're going to SIGGRAPH next week and you want to meet us, then please use the link bit.ly slash SIGCE2017 to, uh, to, uh, to make a reservation for your personal meeting slot. But now let's get started with the Q&A. And if you have a question, please use the question window, type in your question, and then click send. So a lot of questions are coming in here. Uh, I start with the first one, Brandon. It's how important was the art department in the whole city creation process? Uh, the art department and uh, the art directors are, are crucial to what we do because uh, as I showed, um, they're generating the maps. They're showing what the buildings are looking like. They're defining uh, what the street patterns are supposed to look like and providing a lot of inspiration with uh, paintings and uh, drawings that they um, so they're showing kind of what they want everything to look like and really without the art department 
uh, without the stuff that they provide, I'm just sort of winging it and <laughs> trying to make up street patterns. And um, I, I think all I could do was try to hit the shapes that they wanted me to. Um, and I had a lot of fun trying to play around with that and um, giving my own creative feedback sometimes. Uh, but really, without the art department, I'm dead in the water. I mean, I'm a technical guy. Uh, so I, just even getting started would have been more difficult without a, a map and those images to go on. Okay. Thank you. We have tons and tons of questions coming in. Here is one. Hi, Brandon. This is Cleo from Cardiff University, Welsh government. What is your favorite part of the Zootopia city? Uh, well, first of all, hello to all my any Welsh friends that may be listening. I uh, lived in Wales uh, a few years ago uh, as a middle schooler. So, hey, nice to, nice to hear from you. Um, my favorite part of the city, uh, gosh, it, it's probably those big snow cannons in Tundra Town. Like when you're, uh, the train goes through the climate wall from the Sahara to the Tundra, and um, it moves through to this other part of the city, and those big snow cannons go off as the train rides by. And um, that's, probably one of my favorite shots in that sequence um, and it's uh, it just shows kind of the how all of these different parts of Zootopia work together like that climate wall is um, they really spend a lot of time thinking about how one would like the tundra basically air conditioned is air conditioned by blowing all of the heat out of there into Sahara Square and then Sahara Square um, sucking all of the cold air out of there into Tundra Town and all of those things feed together in this way um, it just reminds me about all the thought and um, and planning that went into creating a city that that really made sense for these animals to live in. So that's that was probably what I would say is that part of Tundra Town is my favorite. Okay, I think we, we keep going since there are so many uh, questions coming in. I think three more, if that's okay for you, Brandon. Yeah, that's fine. What was the most challenging thing about doing this amazing city? Asks. Paola Guerra from Esri Colombia. The most, ch the most challenging part, uh, I would probably say dealing with the scale, um, not just the scale of the city itself, which is which is very large, but um, the differences in size that we had to accommodate. Um, a lot of the things I talked about with multi-scaling, like having different size doors and uh, different size buildings, you know, some of that's addressed in the model itself. It has some of those things modeled in. But um, like I briefly touched on, uh, we have to actually distribute our buildings in a different way uh, because of the scale of different parts of the city. Um, like there's that part in the middle of the plaza that uh, there's a chase sequence in the movie that takes place in Little Rodentia. And that's kind of stuck in the middle of all of these other giant buildings uh, for regular sized animals. So we had to think about stuff like that. Um, on top of the fact that we're building out um, these really distinct districts uh, that all have to still connect together in an organic way. Um, so really, the, the amount of data and the scale um, of what's coming out of each of these districts, like I mentioned, we're tens of thousands or sometimes hundreds of thousands of parts uh, in these procedurals that we're generating. Um, Kind of the data management aspect of that was really challenging um, and that's why we had to develop a new sort of data management approach on this movie um we had to carve up the world a little bit differently on big hero six you know you know we had real maps we had real data we had you know actual districts and quarters of the city that were already well defined um like uh, sort of market street or fisherman's wharf places like that uh but on zootopia again we were sort of making up where those things go so having to make those decisions and, and carve things up in a way that made sense and allowed us to handle all of that data uh, was was very challenging. Got it. So we have a question from Christine Wakta from SCAT, and she's writing, I think this is amazing. I'm an architecture professor collaborating with motion media major, and we are looking for ideas like this. How advanced does one need to know City Engine to get close to this? Can, can you a little bit describe your background, how long you have used City Engine, and how long that um, do they have to know until they get close to this? Sure. Um, so I first used City Engine uh, when we were making Big Hero 6. Uh, my own background is in computer science. That's, that's what my undergraduate degree is in. 
um, with, with some interest in art and then my master's is, is in visualization, sort of taking different uh, data sets or, or um, different elements and visualizing them in interesting uh, and uh, sometimes complex ways. So I had a little bit of educational background that sort of prepared me for it, but I had never used the software itself before Big Hero 6. And um, we had a little bigger team of TDs who were working on it, um, myself and Brett, and then we had some other TDs who were working with me on um, the building creation side of things. Um, so I would say the software itself is is not, uh, it, it can be a little bit intimidating to look at if you, um, if it's for an artist who maybe is used to just uh, painting stuff or modeling things, uh, it can be a little bit complex to look at, but uh, for us, it was not that bad. Um, we're able to, once you get down the specifics of the CGA rule syntax, um, we were able to write rules for buildings pretty quickly. Uh, we actually had some scripts that auto-generated rule files to build particular buildings uh, once we got a handle on, on how that syntax works. Um, the difficulty for us, I think, was, was less in using City Engine itself and uh, more in getting it to play nicely with other parts of our pipeline, uh, figuring out how to get that data out of there in a way that we could use in our shots. Um, and that's where uh, my other production experience and working you know, a little bit in computer science and having that understanding uh, helped help us figure out how we can actually leverage this as a tool in our pipeline. Um, and then I think uh, just having, uh, having a good visual eye helped a lot. Uh, I mean, I took a lot of art classes uh, in school as electives in between my computer science coursework um, and was able to do some of the same in my master's work in visualization. So um, it's one thing to have art directors say, you know, make it look like this. And then it's another to be able to actually do that. Um, so having the technical know-how and then just sort of the, the visual understanding of, of being able to achieve what they're asking for, um, those, those things both played into it. So. Got it. So then two more questions. Uh, one is from Jordi. He said, like, how did you manage to solve the var variable slopes on the streets and the building positioning? Did you alter the terrain based on the city engine data? Uh, does this mean like flo floating objects off the ground or I'm not? Can you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Yeah. How did you manage to solve the variable slopes on the streets and the building position? Oh, okay. So I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, okay, the variable slopes on the streets and, you know, placing things on, on steep slopes and yep. terrain, stuff like that. Yep. Um, well, on Zootopia, it was actually not as bad as on Big Hero 6 because, um, so we imported the satellite data and the maps for San Francisco. And we started building stuff on it. And then the directors immediately said, uh, make the hills twice as steep. And we're like, you know, this is San Francisco, right? Like, it, you've been there, right? It's pretty steep already. Um, so we had some pretty extreme cases in Big Hero 6 that kind of helped us develop some logic for how to place our buildings. Um, I mean, we're doing stuff like uh, we created a subfloor rule back on Big Hero 6 that allowed us to um, we place a building on a parcel shape, which is projected down onto the terrain. City Engine has a has a project streets tool that lets us um, kind of match match those polygons to what the terrain is doing. Um, so in addition to that, you still sometimes end up with these gaps, these air gaps between the corner of the building and, and where the actual ground is. So what we did is we make a subfloor rule that actually built downwards. So we can end up with uh, these sort of concrete sub floor looking things um, so we don't end up with those air gaps. And we tried to do the same thing on Zootopia, though it was generally not necessary because we uh, weren't working with the kinds of extreme slopes that we did in San Francisco. Um, but we did have methods to address that, and most of that was what was developed on Big Hero 6. Um, the only really challenging part for Zootopia as far as slopes and rough terrain was concerned was probably in the middle of the city, right there in the, the downtown Zootopia core. Um, there are some rivers and uh, other sort of jagged uh, canyony type things carved out of that part of the ground. Um, and so placing buildings in between those on much skinnier lots. Um, I mean, I was drawing shapes that look sort of like the Hollywood Hills, you know, they're kind of 
zigzagging back and forth, going, uh, working their way up the hill. Um, that was more time consuming than anything, just trying to get the streets that, that made sense to be able to go up those hills. And um, anytime that we couldn't reasonably place a building, um, we just filled out with trees just to maintain visual interest. And honestly, a lot of that stuff gets cut off or hidden by things that are in the foreground. You know, those buildings, the very, very base of them that may not be as pretty looking or maybe floating off the ground slightly or something, um, often that stuff gets hidden anyway. So um, fortunately on Zootopia, it wasn't that big a, of a concern, but we definitely had to address it on Big Hero 6 where the terrain was much steeper. Got it. And Jory just had a follow-up question that, that might also interest uh, several others. He said, like, um, in the past that it try City Engine, but the export part was not still very visual effects friendly. Is this something you could comment further? Thank you. So did you run into any challenges or can you can you uh, elaborate on lesson learned on the on the export? Uh, yeah, totally. So we we also wrestled with this um, uh, back on Big Hero 6, definitely, because we were still this whole process was new. We were trying to figure that out. And, um, you know, the SBX export directly ge exporting geometry only gets you so far because we use Maya and Maya can only handle so much geometry before it crashes. So um, that's why we tried this procedural approach um, and using using a particle system. Um, we had good systems in place for creating and visualizing particle systems already. Um, like I mentioned, Aurora, our in-house tool that we use for that kind of stuff, the, the effects department uses it very heavily. Um, as far as getting the data out of City Engine, uh, it, it did have this reporting function. I mean, that was really the most powerful thing for us is uh, we basically report the position and rotation and scale of a particular building ID and um, we have all that stuff that goes into a record. Uh, it's basically a text file, sort of a custom text file that defines uh, where all these buildings are, how they're oriented, how big they are, uh, and, and which parts it's using. So we know which uh, particular pieces to instance and uh, put together in space to make this building shape. Um, and we sort of had an intermediary process that took this record file and then converted it into our own um, custom procedural that Aurora could read. Um, it, but it took a it took a little bit for us to figure it out. Um, Brett did some really early tests, um, trying to figure out what the upper limit was for the amount of geometry we could export from City Engine. And um, because Hero was very complicated, we're basically building all of San Francisco. Uh, we just found that that wasn't going to be a viable solution for us. So that's why we turned to the procedurals. Um, so and honestly, I would if you're dealing with something that has a lot, a lot of shapes, a lot of geometry. Um, the other thing about the procedural was that uh, it allowed us to just repeat pieces uh, and combine them in different ways. So we didn't have to have the massive library of parts and buildings. We could reuse parts uh, and repeat and combine them in different ways, uh, sort of a, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, which also saves on memory. You know, And, and when it comes to rendering these things, um, the fewer unique pieces you have, uh, the better off you'll be. Um, so that's that's what I would say to that. Thank you for that. And so many good questions are coming in. You guys are, are great. And still, everybody is still here in the webinar. So let's take in the, the extra last one and then uh, let's conclude this. And the last one is from Tim. And he asked, will the city of Zootopia be reused in another movie or maybe a computer <laughs> game, VR simulation? So if you want to uh, announce anything, you, you can do it right now. <laughs> yeah, nice try. Um, <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I can't say. Um, I do know we have, we have made VR experiences for other films. Uh, recently, Moana had one. Um, and I know that we do have a team that does these sort of VR experience things. I do not know if they're using Zootopia in particular for anything like that. Um, I mean, honestly, right now my whole world is uh, Ralph Breaks the Internet, uh, Wreck-It Ralph 2, so <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't say what they're doing beyond that, but um, I would like to. I would love to revisit that city sometime. Um, and if they ever need it, uh, we can always, you know, kind of, we have our rules, we have our parts, we can try to go back and recreate it if they need it. Thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, thanks for all your 
feedback um, and a lot of people were also asking if if we are recording it yes we do recording it and now we'll work afterwards with our friends from Walt Disney Animation Studios to see whether we can uh, release it on our YouTube channel the City Engine YouTube channel uh, to to make it available for you so there were several people who are teaching and wanted to share it with their students and I will make everything uh, possible to 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 uh, publish uh, the recording afterwards, but I have first to work with our friends from Walt Disney Animation. Hope you understand that. Okay, so if we could not answer your question during the webinar, and that's there, some more questions, we will come back to you directly via email or the phone. And let me now conclude the webinar by saying thanks to Brandon for an amazing presentation and insights and for answering so many que questions that's that's much appreciated then let me thank you so much for having me dominic i appreciate it absolutely let me also say thanks to nancy and eric from the visual effect society as well as to amy nick brad and the whole team at walt disney animation studios thank you very much also for joining us today and we hope to see you all next week uh, at sitgraph in beautiful los angeles so that's all for now. Goodbye and auf Wiedersehen.